Um, so yeah, welcome Meredith and welcome to the Escalate Mobile Learning Special Interest Group. And uh, we're keen to hear about some of the projects you've been involved with at Melbourne University. Um, you have you know, briefly talked to me about some of them and some of them sound pretty cool. So um, yeah, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what you've been up to and looking forward to your presentation. Let's you know, have a discussion around some of these projects. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me to, to share um, today. I really appreciate that, this opportunity. Um, I will preface it that I'm coming from a practical pedagogy perspective. So um, I have you know, had a lot of teaching experience in the past, but I, you know, I'm coming at this very much from a practitioner perspective. Um, I've got a PowerPoint, which I'm going to jump a bit between PowerPoint and uh, some web-based resources and things to share. So just bear with me when I jump around a little bit and we'll have lots of time for discussion afterwards as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Yep, we can see your slides now. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, I'm going to start uh, with an acknowledgement of country. So um, I'm located in, in Melbourne um, and I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which I live and work and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Um, today I'm presenting to you um, on the lands of the Wanjiri people, which is also where the University of Melbourne's Parkville campus is located. And I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm going to start by introducing you to my team. <laughs> um, and I hope um, perhaps there'll be an opportunity, um, perhaps early next year, where um, we could do a, a team presentation in this forum. When yeah, that'd be great. We're a bit more kind of all connected together and not so much just uh, working on a lot of Canvas support at the moment. So um, this is my, my wonderful little team. So um, we're a faculty-based resource located in the Faculty of Arts, so in Humanities, Languages and Social Sciences in the University of Melbourne. And uh, when we're on campus, we're located in the amazing Arts West building in the digital studio. So um, my team have been um, in one form or another together since uh, the middle of 2012. We've kind of evolved a little bit. We used to have a web team um, with us as well, but um, we're just purely e-learning and teaching at the moment. And uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're a little team. Um, and in, in fact, Grace, who's on our right, um, she's, she was a multimedia um, student intern with us up until when we went off campus. So, um, we, we're not really having, unfortunately, um, much opportunity to work with her at the moment, but um, I will be showing you some of the things that she's been involved with um, in, in some of our projects. And then um, directly next to me is Sam, um, sitting next to me, who's um, a videographer in our team. And then um, behind me is Mitch Buzzer, um, who's quite extraordinary. Um, he's he does a lot of our uh, LMS support and digital media production and um, yeah uh, all of us are working in the tell space but um, Mitch in particular has done quite a lot of um, really interesting use of tools um, 360 type work so I'll, I'll show you some of those examples. And, and is that, that a real name Mitch Buzzer or is Mitch, that a pseudonym? It's a real name <laughs> <laughs> and then next to him we've got um, Daniel Hayward um, um, Dan's also a videographer and when we're on campus he primarily looks after our loans equipment office which I'll also talk about. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of um, I guess what it's like supporting TEL within the humanities, languages, social sciences area um, and I guess some, some of how we've adapted um, to supporting staff while we've been off campus but also I'm going to try to show you some of um, the projects that we've been working on that are more around the uh, immersive technology space and this has been work that we've been doing for a couple of years but um, I guess you know it's been exciting to see how that's adapted somewhat um, with the opportunities during COVID. So um, I'm just going to just start by um, showing you this um, teaching online hub which 
some of you have probably seen before, but this is something that we started putting together quite rapidly when we first went off campus, um, just as a way of, of bringing together all the resources that um, we were collating rapidly and putting together to support teaching staff. Um, that's been a, yeah, I suppose, a different way in which we would normally support staff. And I'm just gonna quickly jump out of PowerPoint and just share my, um, sorry, I'll just be a sec. I'm just gonna get up um, another example to, to show you because this evolves quite frequently. Um, can so everybody... is, is Padlet a new uh, platform for uh, the arts faculty or did you already have a Padlet installed? Um, we've been using it for many years actually since about 2014 um, in fact yeah are you seeing um, my my screen yeah. my browser yep okay great, so... great resource by the way man just really find it very <laughs> useful oh thank you that's great to hear um, this is what we used to do so we used to have um, one of our our main ways of supporting staff, we used to run um, a pre-semester blended learning boot camp that would be a face-to-face -face event for, for teaching staff. So this is, for instance, an example of um, a Padlet wall that we would have used for, this is the one we actually used um, middle of last year. We did do a boot camp just before we went off campus earlier this year, but we had it very much focused on Canvas. Um, Melbourne University has migrated from Blackboard to Canvas this year. So we, we had um, our support really focused on, on Canvas um, earlier this year. But just to give you an idea, that's sort of yeah, how, we, how we've often used um, Padlet to put together a lot of different resources. And the way in which our boot camp um, used to run was uh, we would have, just show you this here. Um, can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we used to have um, this program that would run for a couple of days and we'd have a, a one day compulsory intensive program that would be introduction to quite a lot of different tools that you could use in, in active learning, um, whether it's face to face or online, um, different approaches to active learning and combining tools for that and but we used to um, and we used to have a lot of focus on the LMS sort of holding everything together as well but we used to have um, sessions that were um, this sort of experimenter type forum which Mitch Buzzer used to run um, which really looked at some immersive learning experiences so it was often a way of exposing teaching staff to um, a range of different opportunities and then they would choose what they wanted to commit to for the other days of boot camp and we would then um, give them the opportunity to make high quality videos with us, um, conceptual videos, it might be you know, animated videos, um, all sorts of things and then um, it would all get embedded ready to go in the LMS so we'd do LMS makeovers make sure everything was kind of all nicely all put together ready first semester to start. So we've adapted from that obviously to um, more of a remote support model with lots of workshops. Um, we did a big blast pre-semester um, in July where we um, had lots of different workshops. We co-presented a lot of these um, with learning environments just to, because um, yeah, it was just an easier way of doing it all at scale and to bring in the expertise of their um, their learning designers as well. So we had some virtual working bees as part of that, which worked really well also. And that's sort of really how we adapted um, our support during COVID. So I will jump back into PowerPoint now and continue on. Do you have any idea of how many people would perhaps uh, interact with your Padlets on a mobile device as opposed to the, uh, you know, the web on a laptop or desktop? Yeah, no, I haven't actually looked into that. It would be very interesting to, to find out. Um, I think there are some stats in Padlet, but I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, haven't had a look at that. So. Yeah, I think it does tell you analytics around the device that's uh, uh, viewed, etc. Yeah. Yeah, um, so we use this opportunity of, you know, everyone being migrated to Canvas to, to really reframe how we look at the LMS. Um, I think previously we had a lot of staff that were really just using it as a, as a file server, just 
you know, putting files in there, videos in there, but not really thinking through the student's perspective. And so we've been trying to encourage this view of, of considering every Canvas subject site as a learning community, as an online hub that's tying together all the communication we have with students, the learning materials, synchronous, asynchronous interaction, um, summative and formative assessments, individual and group activities. So, yeah, in part of that rethinking how to support our teaching colleagues and how to scale up and out some of our strategies, and in particular, uh, when we were looking from the end of first semester into second semester and how we could have a better quality of, of remote learning or online teaching. Um, these are some of the things that we, some of the strategies that we have come up with. So we've had, um, we've had a lot of um, practice sharing and drop-in help sessions, they're weekly. Um, we've had them for different disciplines as well. So we've tried to bring in that, um, that flavour of, of different tools and different needs that perhaps um, our different disciplines have. We've got five different disciplines in the Faculty of Arts. So that's been quite a useful approach to really tailoring support with what teaching staff have asked for. Um, and yeah, we've been also trying to model approaches in how we've delivered our training as well. So we've tried to, to facilitate using different tools within the breakout rooms in Zoom, um, making lots of short video walkthroughs that we can email staff and really trying to build capacity in staff. And I'll take you through some of the, um, the discipline sort of layer and lens that we've been trying to make sure that we um, have some focus on as well. Are you finding that you're perhaps um, getting to the point where uh, people are being a little bit more self-sufficient um, or are they still heavily yeah. relying on your team? Um, no, I think definitely um, more self-sufficient. And I think too, we've seen a real increase in teaching staff sharing what they're doing with their colleagues. So really, you know, giving their colleagues a chance to see examples of what they're doing and how they're using tools. So that, that sharing um, between teaching staff is something that I haven't quite seen happen in the way that it has been during recent months. So there's definitely been an increase of that and, and just helping each other out as well. So that's been really great to see. So yeah, just um, some of those um, key things around um, the learning sequence in modules in Canvas, we've been um, trying to put emphasis on that and the consistency and how activities and materials are set up within modules, the clarity of the module titles, um, thinking through uh, when you jump into a Canvas site and you go into the modules, if you collapse everything, that you get a nice clear outline by the title of the modules, um, of the overall subject shape and where it's going. And then um, when you actually go into a module, that it's quite clear to students, um, you know, why those items are in there, why the content's in there, um, the order in which they're working through learning activities. And so it's really explicitly clear to students that there's a structure in there and um, what the learning sequence is and how things really relate to um, Zoom sessions or face-to-face -face synchronous sessions that they might be having as well. Um, and we've been making use of learning technologies throughout. So um, some, these are just some of the, the ones that have been, I guess, highlighted a little bit more and definitely pairing them with the active learning approaches. We've had lots of discussions with people about, um, you know, how you can do these specifically within Zoom breakout rooms. Um, and also we've got some teaching staff that are using Microsoft Teams as well. Um, I'll show some examples of SeatGeek a little bit later and one of 3D Vista as well. Um, Perusal was, was one that um, was actually used very early on by our Masters of Translation teaching staff. So um, this is a collaborative reading tool and it, it reads in the language. And um, this, this, this was from a subject that um, right at the start of semester, um, they had students that couldn't get into Australia. So there were, there were students that um, were impacted by the travel ban. This was even before, you know, COVID had really hit us. So they were using this tool um, to really engage um, students with the reading, um, giving students the opportunity to ask questions. Um, it gave teaching staff a better idea of the students' understanding. Um, and then the teaching staff would take the asynchronous discussion points and use them to frame and, and integrate into the synchronous lectures and shoots in Zoom. 
So there is um, a little video interview that we, we did and I'll share that um, as a link later on that Tom can share with people. I'll, I'll put it into the uh, metadata of the YouTube uh, okay. archive. Um, and this is one of our um, Korean language um, academics who um, was wanting a way of, uh, when we went off campus, of, of students being able to have um, language practice in pairs, oral language practice in pairs. So this was a use of Padlet, um, so students were able to record themselves just using the post option within Padlet. There's um, an option for, for both making a little video, but also making an audio recording. And so they could just easily post that. And it, it meant that teaching staff had this all in one place and also students could listen to each other's practice as well. So what's the sort of uh, time limit on the built in audio recording of Padlet? Um, I'm not sure you see that, but most of these are, you know, sort of under five minutes. So I yep. think that are short little things. I don't know whether there's a maximum. I haven't tested that out yet. Um, mostly with the sorts of videos that we add into Padlet walls, we're hosting them elsewhere and just linking to them or embedding them. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. One of the drawbacks of this, unfortunately, is that, um, you know, we wish there was a way that teaching staff could leave some oral feedback. You can see here that, that it's written feedback in the comments, but there is another tool, tool voice thread, which has been used in a sort of similar way, but most of the staff have had some ex exposure to Padlet. So they've been you know, adapting using Padlet in this way. Um, this is a, another example. Um, this was a French subject that I'll talk about a little bit later in the heart of the Loire Valley, which is offered um, in situ in France every second year. And yeah, actually, ironically, this year would have been in France. <laughs> we, we started working on it last year um, because it's been uh, a subject that has been very popular and they wanted to have a fully online version that could be offered as a winter intensive that would run yeah, fully online. So we actually did a lot of work last year in adapting the subject and designing it intentionally for fully online delivery. And we've been able to enhance that this year because the students obviously didn't get to go. So these are students introducing themselves um, in, in French and just again posting that to the Padlet wall. So all those videos are hosted on YouTube or somewhere else? Um, they're on Padlet. They're directly recorded like, in Padlet? Um, I, think, I, no, I think there's a mixture of, of some have been um, uploaded from like uploading the file into Padlet. Some of them have been recorded with Padlet and some of them are elsewhere. Um, and yeah, just to show you, Padlet obviously supports um, language. Um, so this is yeah, this is an activity where students have been able to post on one of the particular site visits, the castles that students would normally go to. And I'll I'll show you some examples in SuiteMake a little bit later on. Um, this is another use um, for one of our. Um, culture and communication subjects. This is um, Diana Sanders and she wanted um, a way of students being able to have an in-country experience and do this in a virtual way. So we've got a little video um, story interview with her as well which again we'll share. But um, this is the idea of using a Padlet, what I call a Padlet hub. So each of these are um, separate Padlet walls that um, so these tiles link out to separate Padlet walls for each of the different tube groups and then the students were able to in pairs um, post their their little um, on country um, experience so they were you know able to write something up and find images and post and then they were able to comment on each other's so it's it's quite a it's been quite an interesting way of, of doing something in a in a virtual way so students get their own uh, Padlet um, account or or not? Well, they're working in, in pairs, so they've posted, um, every tute group has had its own Padlet walls. So they've done it within, um, within a, a tute group and then pairs have posted. So they're still, they're still posting, I guess, um, without having a Padlet account as such, but it's all um, entered through the LMS. So they authenticate through the LMS and all of the walls are set to secret, so they're not discoverable. Does that, I don't know if that answers your question though. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah. that's good. Um, and in terms of just how we would normally support video production, um, we filmed on our last day when we went off campus um, back in March. We, 
quickly we're into, we've got a couple of object-based learning labs within ArtsWest and the faculty has had a big emphasis on object-based learning. So for a while now we've been looking at ways of um, really augmenting those labs with um, technology and being able to yeah, make resources that can be used in, in different delivery modes. So we quickly went um, into the lab with this academic, um, Matthew Martin, and yeah, we actually filmed him handling objects. And then we did, I think about a, I don't know, an hour or two of filming that day. And then all of that's been able to be edited from home and still was used um, in first semester in um, this particular subject on collection management. Um, and in terms of the loans equipment office, um, we were able to make a whole lot of how-to equipment videos that were used in the specialist journalism and media and comms subjects that we support. So students, um, where they were able to come on campus just before you know everything closed down, we were able to lend them a camera kit for the duration of semester. And we've had um, that first group of students come in and return the equipment. Another group have come and picked it up, and we've sort of done that a couple of times now. We're now in a bit of a position where we can't get on campus and students can't get on campus. So we're just making do with what we can, but um, teaching staff are finding ways of, of still teaching um, these subjects uh, using the videos that we've created and uh, also with students just using whatever device, particularly mobile devices, instead of the, the high-end cameras. So it's been a bit of a, a workaround for that. So I'm going to now just take you a bit more into some of the examples um, that are, are more of the immersive learning experiences that we've been working on in recent years. So um, this one here um, is uh, using uh, tilt brush and sketch pads. So as I mentioned, um, we've had quite a big emphasis on object-based learning with the Arts West building, which opened in 2016. And the building itself, really embeds object-based pedagogy in learning and teaching. So when you actually get a chance to, to see it, um, Tom, <laughs> you'll notice that there's, there's actually on the outside of the building, there are in the, in the, the sort of the hoarding, the fins on the outside of the building, there's actually objects that have been you know, built into that and there's display cases throughout the building. So it's really been, um, yeah, bringing objects into teaching and learning this display cases in corridors, foyers um, and other spaces. And also these, these two labs as well. So um, objects have been very much um, interpreted in terms of um, whether they're natural history specimens, works of art, archaeological relics, manuscripts, rare books, archival documents or historical artefacts. And so um, this OBL has been incorporated into a variety of our subjects and disciplines, um, ancient world studies, archaeology, art history, classics, creative writing, cultural studies, history, literature, politics. So it's, it's been very much an active and exploratory experience and students really love having these experiences. So we've been working with the teaching staff to augment the OBL focus, um, giving accessibility in a virtual space to objects that aren't in the university's collection. And um, Mitch has done a lot of work with scanning objects and um, being able to embed them in the LMS. And we've evolved in collaboration with working with other um, tech professional staff within learning environments and also within the library space as well. And this one here um, just shows you yeah, a little bit more about the visual analysis. And um, this is an example with tilt brush. So the visual analysis is to recognise and understand the visual choices an artist has made in creating an artwork or an object by observing and writing about separate parts of an object, the colours, lines, textures, size. And this, um, that example that you just saw in that video, um, we've been doing work with Dr Monique Weber um, to integrate these methods of visual analysis in her study of classical societies. So Monique's um, quite interesting. She, um, her journey began with simple um, using 3D objects on Sketchfab um, and she put them in a array of PowerPoints and then um, painting on the objects themselves in Google tilt brushes you saw through to immersing herself 
in the virtual space. So we've worked with her along the way to, um, to use Tilt Brush and Sketchfab and um, yeah, and instead of annotating on a flat two dimensional plane, we've been able to annotate objects in three dimensions. Have you done any sort of analysis of the impact on, you know, uh, student learning of using that immersive environment rather than the 2D? No, not, um, well, not in a, in a, um, in a quantitative way at all. It's, it's really just been feedback of, of students level of engagement, but that's probably something we should look at during a, yeah, a study into definitely. So um, we've looked at different ways of creating learning experiences and learning materials um, to enhance that engagement level. Um, we've also looked at immersing students into different environments. And we've also been looking at application in different teaching modes as well. So yeah, last year, this is very much what we we're looking at. We had um, different examples of in face-to-face -face, where we have in-class active learning opportunities for incursions, um, virtual field trips. Um, we often would have the journalism students or different you know, groups of, of students and we'd be asked to put together some sort of active learning, virtual reality experiences and workshops for them. Um, then there's been opportunity around, obviously with blended learning, so making material available um, that might be used in class or outside of class through the LMS. And then we've, we've also had fully online subjects. So, Do students get to uh, create those or is it all another form of um, yeah. you know, content delivery? That's a very good question. So we have been deliberately choosing very simple to use no coding tools so that students will be able to use these things themselves. We've only um, done a couple of workshops with, with different subjects with students actually um, using those sorts of tools, but we're hoping that that will be something that we can do more with. So as part of the, um, the, the subject design, there might be some, um, some labs that we could run that students can learn these tools. Yeah, and, and, and so, you know, you could uh, bring that into the assessment. So, uh, you know, the an assessment becomes creating a virtual uh, tour or a virtual object uh, in critiquing that. Definitely, and I think, you know, with that French subject the, in the heart of the Wild Valley, there's definitely the opportunity for the students, whether they're, you know, the subjects run on site or whether it's still online, to develop these, these sorts of um, learning materials that could then actually be embedded back into the subject. So students could, as part of their assessment, develop um, different materials that that could also build and be yeah, a resource for the subject. So yeah, very much been looking at opportunities for embeddable media types and formats um, where we can add in hotspots and audio and video and yeah, things that teaching staff and students can do for themselves. So, um, yeah, so we've had a, a combination of medium quality and DIY approaches that the team have explored in recent years. And that's, that's very much been the direction that we've been seeing teaching and learning heading in our faculty. So, yeah, modelling that represents something the students could do themselves, um, enabling students to act on the material and develop the content, um, application across interactive field trips or tours, digital storytelling, presentations, um, alternatives to traditional essay assessments. So we have had um, some subjects where the students, rather than in history, rather than doing a traditional essay, have actually done a, either a narrated PowerPoint or they've made a video. They've still submitted the, the script as part of the assessment and they've submitted a rationale for their project, but it's ended up being a digital media essay rather than a traditional written essay. So do you, um, how do you teach the staff to assess these things? To assess in terms of um, the, the, uh, the digital media component, do you mean? Um, yes, yeah, so if you've got um, 
history teachers, for example, are they used to um, receiving some sort of audiovisual material and assessing it and even providing comments back in that sort of format? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good question, Tom, because you've got to you know, build into, if you've got a creative assessment assignment, uh, how's that marked and what's the criteria? You know, is there a rubric based to guide students and what they actually need to do in that new format? Yeah, well, the history staff we've worked quite closely with. So, um, yes, the emphasis is, is always on, on the content rather than on the, the actual digital media production. So that's always emphasised. So um, normally we have a meeting with the teaching staff and they will tell us what they're thinking, will suggest some ideas, and yet they'll come up with whatever the, the rubric is. But it's always the emphasis is on the content rather than the digital media. Well, I was, I suppose I was thinking, um, do those staff actually have a go at preparing material in this format? Um, oh, yep. So they're familiar with the problems involved. Yeah, definitely. Um, the particular history staff I'm thinking of, yes, definitely. Um, the French staff in the heart of the Loire Valley um, option, yes. So yeah, they're normally familiar with um, these tools as well, yeah. And so I'll just take you through a little bit more, a few more examples. So um, part of our research is focused on finding these simple drag and drop software tools that don't involve coding for building VR and 360 experiences. And we've also been very much building that skill base of our teaching, the teaching staff that we support. So that's why we've had this focus on, on the simple software and or simple to medium production options. I assume it's also um, quite cost effective as well. If you're looking at simple solutions, then they're not going to be, you know, high end software um, subscriptions required, etc. Yeah, yep. So these are a couple of tools that we found um, roundme.com, um, which has features such as embeddable video, directional audio, easy drag and drop interface, um, Vimeo 360, has 360 video playback, um, it doesn't have the ads and overlays of YouTube. Google Tour Creator, um, which allows you to combine street view images, map data, your own 360 photos and your own voiceovers to create a VR tour for the web. We've also got classroom sets of Google Cardboards and we've, we did buy some other headsets um, at the start of the year, which are still sitting in boxes that we haven't had a chance to do anything with yet. Um, and also, we've done quite a bit with Sketchfab as well, um, which can be described um, as like YouTube for 3D models, allows you to add in hotspots and voiceovers, and it's been great for 360 images and also handling 3D models. So the, the latest uh, development with um, SeekBeak, uh, Meredith, is a direct uh, input-export into... Uh, Google. Yes, uh, Google Street View, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing with that. Um, yeah, so this is an example, and I think Charles Saverni covered this a little bit uh, in his presentation. Yeah, he mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we were involved quite early on with Brent Davis, who's the subject coordinator of these Egyptian, ancient Egyptian language subjects. Um, and so we were, yeah, looking at um, collating hieroglyphic JPEGs, um, yeah, Brent had this idea of this online memory flashcard app and building a in-house prototype app. So we were involved with all the different aspects um, of that. And this, this led to, uh, to using a resource that's available, it's a free resource on the Oculus store, which is um, this Nefertari's tomb. Experience. It'll also be interesting, again, once again, how do you evaluate the impact on student learning and, and uh, what sort of analytics are built into these tools? Like, uh, you know, in, in SeekBeak, you can use the, uh, the heat map or eye tracking and just wondering whether you can do the similar sort of thing in, in uh, you know, some of these other immersive VR environments as well as get some data analysis on where are students looking? Are they actually focused on what they should be or are they, they just distracted and uh, looking around the edges? Yeah, I think when we're back on campus, that's something we will definitely input, yeah, put some focus on to actually evaluating everything. 
Um, I do have a little video here. I might just play a few, just a little bit of it. Um, this is from the interview that we did with Brent. Um, now, can you, can you let me know if you can hear if the sound I'm Brent through? Davis. I teach archaeology. Is that coming through okay? Yes. Yeah. Yep, great. I'm Brent Davis. I teach archaeology, ancient history, and ancient Egyptian here at the university. And I've just had my advanced Egyptian class in here today looking at Nefertari's tomb and reading the walls. Rather than reading texts on a, in a modern textbook, to be able to go in and actually examine the original objects, um, it, it essentially amounts to a form of object-based learning, which is something we're trying to bring into more of our classes uh, in ancient languages. So this is a wonderful uh, way of doing that. Um, I could easily see uh, the Greek and Latin teachers using this technology for the, exactly the same thing, to take their students to some kind of a space in uh, Rome or in Greece uh, where they can read original inscriptions directly. It's a, a very valuable uh, experience for the students and, and very engaging for them too. The students have been studying hieroglyphs now for a full two years. Uh, these texts inside the tomb are not surprisingly religious texts. They talk about the deceased queen and about her passage into the afterlife, about her friendship with and, and, and the guardianship of uh, the various gods and goddesses. It's full of formulaic expressions that the students know. They were able to actually pick out lots and lots of those. Uh, it was very enjoyable actually watching them do this because they were just so absorbed, absolutely lost in the experience. And it's a good after that. The only thing that we're missing in this experience is the ability to actually reach out and touch the walls. Uh, but um, as several of the students today said during the session, um, I feel like I'm there. And that's what counts. I'm definitely going to use it more. Uh, I'll bring um, all. Well, I'll stop that there. Um, and also following on from that, so that, that's obviously in a, in a tomb in, in royalty. We also started looking um, at ways we could do something with, with stelae. Stelae are like the poor person's tombstone. And I've got a little video here. So um, we were finding these, these stelae um, Brent had a whole collection of them and there's just lots you can find on the web as well. So Mitch came up with this little process of being able to put the collection together and come up with a workflow. And we're hoping the students eventually will be able to you know, create their own stilly. We've done this at open days in the past on campus, which has been really great. So students can spin these stilly models, um, zoom in and look at the different aspects. And we're hoping in the future that we could use this, this kind of approach in the subject with um, using the models in quizzes, um, republishing with voiceover audios attached, annotating and marking up with metadata and translations. So yeah, we're hoping that it could be yeah, something the students can really do in the future. I think one of the interesting things would be how do you build into that sort of format, uh, you know, formative feedback and you know, a feedback loop for around their learning. Um, you know, some of the tools allow you to embed things like surveys and polls um, but you know even being able to have live feedback from your tutor yeah or even build into that a social virtual reality experience you know rather than it's all individual at the moment i'm taking notes as we go so thank you <laughs> these are great suggestions um yeah so just uh yeah this heart of the Loire valley subject that i've mentioned a couple of times i will show you the seat beak examples so they were just put together very quickly with materials that we had actually from the teaching staff. So they'd taken a lot of 180 degree panoramic images. Um, they had lots of detailed photos of you know, sculptures, paintings and things. So we just put together what we could into Seatbeak to make these uh, interactive tours or self-paced site visits for uh, six different sites in the Loire Valley. And also, integrating them with um, with online group and individual group activities as well. So Seatbeak is just a very simple to use tool. I actually heard about it through Tom. So <laughs> I think that was at a, a slight workshop many years ago. 
Um, and again, we're hoping that, yeah, this will be something that can be used for students' assessment tasks in the future. I will uh, jump out and show you outside of um, Western Reading PowerPoint. So did you uh, supply lecturers with 360 degree cameras that they took you know, on visits themselves? We have done that in another example I'm going to talk about, I think um, Latin American studies in Cuba. This particular one, um, they just had photos that they'd taken, panoramic photos on their phone, and then we yeah. just looked also what we could find through 360 cities and other sites that we could use copyright free. But most of it was using the materials that um, yeah, teaching staff actually had. So they'd um, recorded little snippets of um, site visits with curators talking and so we we're able to embed some of that in there so i think next time we can yeah, give them 360 cameras when they're actually able to go to france and we can think through how we can put these together and make them much richer. yeah sort of storyboard the the content that you're after yeah i'll just uh yeah so it's just very easy to use so the, this is just showing me how it's put together so it's just very easy to use tools And yeah, this is um, another quite interesting example that's been adapted, evolved in last year to what's happening now. So um, in this one, teaching staff have gone to Cuba before and taken a 360 camera and did have material for us to work with. So um, we had in the digital studio, we, we had a, um, two groups of students, master's subject and an undergraduate subject for Latin American studies. This is um, Adrian Hearn. And um, we put together, because um, we didn't have many headsets last year, so we actually put together four groups of students circulating amongst four different stations. And that was the way we were um, able to do it. Um, my camera's just gone off. Can you still see me and hear me? Uh, we can hear you, we can't see okay. you. You can't see me, but you can see my slides, okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just getting a weird message coming up on my screen. <laughs> um, yep, okay. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, so we've done it before, designing the activity whereby students had four different stations that they moved between. Um, so you can see some of them you know, using Google Cardboard, some of them got the Oculus Rift here. This is a, a two-dimensional type documentary experience they were able to talk about, watch together, here they're interacting with 360 video on an iPad. So we did the best we could with that last year. And I think I've got a little example here. This is actually Mitch here, just um, showing what the students were able to, to interact with. So we've got um, different scenes within Cuba. Some of this is actually my, um, some of footage that I took when I went to Cuba many, many years ago that we were able to just do something with <laughs> um, in this format as well. So um, medicinal plants is one bit we've got, it just focuses on really the, the culture and spiritual aspects and the relationship with music as well. And then students um, had iPads, they walked between the four different stations. We set up quite elaborate Padlet walls. So we had the four different groups. Um, so put here on a Padlet hub, and then students would reflect both on the content of what they were seeing and the, um, they re would reflect on the experience as well. So every station had two columns for that. And then the whole cohort came back together and had a discussion at the end of the session. Um, and this is a quote from, from Adrian, um, just reflecting back on the, the students' experience. So they were really interested in the format. Um, yeah, and it opened up debate about the ethics of digital humanities, particularly around the consent and challenges raised by 360 video. And then this year, um, we'd hoped to do something similar on campus. Um, Adrian's had this project that um, is more of a, a research project, but it's been brought into teaching. So it's called Who is, Who is Nature? It uses some of the previous material that you saw um, from 2019. And um, I'll show you an example of this a bit later on. 
um, when we jump out of PowerPoint. But yeah, it invites the viewer on a virtual journey to five different sites of human interaction with nature. So students were able to still have um, an, ass an assessment in first semester, which reflected on this. Not many students were able to use it properly in VR. They don't have the equipment at home, but um, they were able to just use it on their computers as 360 video and still quite a useful experience for them. This one here I think is quite an interesting one. So this one um, we filmed last year and this is um, Brian Logg and Dominique Safari um, from Culture and Communications. And I think I've got, yeah, I can just show you here. So this was, um, we just went and filmed just with um, the 360 camera that we had. And we went, three of us just went, we're actually, can sort of see us in the background in some of this. We actually just went to different, um, I think there were 16 different places we went to just really quickly over a couple of hours um, down around the arts precinct in Melbourne. So this, this was really about students getting a feel for how the arts precinct um, is situated within Melbourne. So it's around the South Bank campus. I'll come back to this one in a moment. Around the South Bank campus and um, so it was just a conversation, a very informal conversation between those two different teaching staff. Um, it was filmed on a Garmin 360 Verve camera and it was really to introduce our international students to the cultural precinct of Melbourne. Um, Dominique also wanted to, uh, his use of it was quite different. So he was able to embed um, documents around policy, around um, arts policy and Brian used it more to, to, to work with his international students. So they, rather than him having to sort of take them on this, this site visit that they would normally go on, um, we had this version that he was able to show them and use in teaching this year. So the students could just get familiar with, you know, where the different arts and theatres and things are within Melbourne and, and also um, introduce students to the South Bank campus as well. Um, this example here is, um, a, again, one that we've used that has been kind of repurposed in, in or ha has had multiple purposes. So this was filmed um, in the old arts building um, in the Ball, McMahon Ball Theatre and using an Insta, Insta Pro 360 camera. And it's the assassination scene from Julius Caesar. So the idea was um, that <laughs> um, teaching staff wanted to have um, some, some material that students wouldn't have been able to see anywhere else in any other production of Shakespeare, they wouldn't have seen this particular interpretation. So it was a departure from some of our other approaches. Um, it was quite a, a, involved quite a lot of collaboration, high production quality, um, was produced with a budget. Um, it involved our arts faculty external relations as well. They ended up um, making a, a having a hackathon event out of this um, to, to help um, build engagement with future students as part of the faculty's you know, broader marketing strategy around the Bachelor of Arts. But this involves um, third year VCA acting students and um, the subject coordinator so directed the performance. So they made modifications, um, they you know, scripted it all and made modifications in how it was um, performed to, to really suit 360. So that was also quite interesting last year. So that's been able to be used in um, David McGuinness's um, Shakespeare subjects, which are running this semester. So I think I've nearly finished. Um, this is really, I guess, some of our key learnings and, and future directions, um, really about building in reflection and evaluation into the design of the learning activity. Some of the questions that um, you've all raised have, have really been around that. And that's something that, yeah, we need to, to have more of a process around and I think will be the next stages for us as well. And we're also just starting to embark on one now, which is actually an arts um, seed research project at the moment, but it's to build a model um, for Manus Island. And so we'll be building a digital representation of the Manus Island Detention Centre, and that will be accessible through an interactive 360 VR experience. Um, it will have hotspots in it, links to additional material, we, we've done a little bit of um, some initial modelling with that, but um, Sam and Mitch will be working on that um, later this semester. I'd imagine there'd be some uh, 
ethics consent uh, issues that you'd need to work through with that as well. Yeah, um, that's all. Yeah, that's all part of it. Um, and I'll just really quickly just jump back into uh, my web browser. Just one moment. And the Who is Nature one, this is the Cuban one that I mentioned before. I'll just quickly show you what it now looks like. This is obviously just on my screen. So this was used for a first semester assessment. For the students. In fact, they had hobnail boots on. It does go on for a while, so I might um, pause it and I'll send around the link and you can have a look at it. Um, these are the, just really quick way to finish, these are the the seat back ones. So you can see where the stitching is. It's not great, but just in terms of getting, you know, something put together that, you know, would be a sort of an approximate of students not being able to get there. It, I think it, it worked quite well. Um, it's just, yeah, another one. So there's, there's hot spots all the way through. Some of them have got quizzes built into them as well and other videos so yeah so I'll stop there and just yeah open up for any questions yeah very cool some great projects there thank you and it'd be great next year to yeah might get Sam and Mitch to present some of what they've been doing I think that would be really great yeah, and not only that, I think, uh, you know, do some publishing around what you've done as well. Is it question time? Yes, it is. I know you've been, been waiting for those questions, Tom. Chamfing at the bit here. Uh, I, I suppose my, my main question is about um, how do you do this for the students and courses of the future. So will you be able to find a package of equipment that students can afford to use off campus? Because students will be off campus most of the time in the future. Um, and could this be used for doing the human aspects of STEM courses? I'm in the human computer interface part of the ANU, for example, um, because if the government's funding goes through, there'll be many fewer humanities students. So in a practical sense, you've got to find something to do for the students you do have. So could you use this for service courses for um, STEM disciplines, for example? Yeah, I think definitely that's the way it's, it's moving. Um, I've already had a few conversations with our work integrated learning coordinator about, you know, industry placement type things and what we can do as well. So, yeah, everything's up for grabs, I think. Yeah. It was interesting. I had a, had a bit of a discussion with someone from uh, UNSW um, a couple of days ago about, you know, the impact of arts, change in arts funding for Australia and will that hugely impact their students? And they didn't think it would. They just their take on it was basically the students don't really care about the money. They, you know, the young that are it as, you know, might not ever pay it back or it's something in the future. So it's not going to stop them doing their arts degree. Um, I thought that was an interesting take on it. But I think definitely humanities, you know, in all universities, they're going to have to really think through their offering and be really clear on what that is. And particularly, I guess, Melbourne University, because we have been very much a face-to-face institution and I guess how can we have the best of both the bringing the 
the physical campus, you know, into the virtual space and vice versa, how we can sort of do that well. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, Tom's question around costings and, you know, an affordable student kit to be able to do this sort of thing. Well, it is actually quite affordable. You can do certainly 360 imagery just with a smartphone and stitching with a whole variety of apps, including Google Street View. And now with that direct link into SeekBeak, it's going to be really simple. The issue is around 360 video because you can't do that with a single lens. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, how do you repur repurpose the, the cost of a course for a student where instead of making them pay for a $200 textbook, they, uh, they buy a $200 um, 360 degree camera, which is actually, you can. Um, so it's just rethinking through what's important, what, what are the costs we're putting on students and how can we achieve doing some of these really immersive stuff. And I'd be happy to volunteer to go to chateaus to um, make the films. <laughs> <laughs> go and capture some content. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have one question, Tom. Um, thank you, Meredith. That was a wonderful um, uh, presentation. And what, what struck me um, being, in, being in Japan is that you have a team of five or six um, support staff for one faculty. And I've been to AUT where I've, there, was, there was a team of about 10 or 12 to support the, the whole university. And where I, where I work, it's a, quite a big place and there, there isn't one person to support, um, uh, you know, 16,000 students. So I, I'm just wondering how common this uh, support team is and whether your group and um, AUT's group is unusual um, or is this a sort of fairly common thing across Australia and New Zealand? I think we're quite unusual. Um, so we were formed in 2012, but I think, I mean, really at the moment, um, there's four of us and it's really not enough. In fact, there's probably, Sam's actually on a, uh, you know, as a casual, so there's really only three of us full time. And we, we, we do leverage where we can, um, like having Grace, a multimedia intern, she did a lot of work on the seat beak last year. That was fantastic having her. So, um, I think opportunities where there might be, you know, placements for students to volunteer or to, to have like an internship, definitely make use of those because they, ah, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they think, you know, they'll see like a student and they, they can see it from both perspectives. So it was, it was fabulous having Grace last year. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my suggestion where you can leverage off, you know, if there are internship mm -hmm. possibilities. Yeah. I mean, if you focus on uh, enabling student generated content, then, uh, there's your production team as your students doing authentic assignments and you know once the first year's done done stuff then uh, there's your examples for the following year i think collaborating with others across the institution is really important that's something that we do uh, we've always collaborated very closely with our colleagues at learning environments um, the who is who is nature that was very much a collaboration between the learning environments digital production team and um, sam and mitch and my team so yeah, I think it, it's really important to do that with um, a lot of the work that we've done in SeatBeak um, with 3D models, we've used Ben Crunan from the library to help with that and Ben Loveridge from Learning Environment. So I think, you know, disciplines can definitely, faculties can definitely bring in, um, I suppose we're closer to the academics so we can you know, bring in the use cases and the examples and the content and, um, but definitely leveraging, you know, collaborating is the way to go, I think with, mm. with this, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, my, my resource would be the students. Uh, there aren't any faculty teams to collaborate with. So, uh, yeah, th thanks very much for that. It's very useful. Yeah, but you, you can collaborate with Meredith and, you know, um, uh, myself and, and, and other people uh, beyond your own institution. Um, yeah. So that's another way to do it. Yeah, true. It's kind of a bit of a catch-22 with the whole COVID-19 thing around resourcing and support for educational technology. Um, it's highlighted the need for it, uh, but then the issue is that student, uh, universities are all going to be strapped for you know, staffing, funding in the future. So even though they need uh, teams like ours, etc., cetera, um, can they afford them uh, or are they willing to you know, hire more people? Um, yeah, it's a big question. Um, you know, just for example, you know, uh, Canterbury University had uh, one person uh, supporting their early e-learning platform prior to COVID. They're now hiring, I think, a team of four uh, 
currently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, have they got the money or not to invest? Um, interesting. Which raises the question, um, um, have you thought about if, for example, universities in Japan don't have this, could you um, offer these services commercially? Um, that, that's always I, an um, issue for uh, uh, development TNC. units. Uh, and, and I have seen that backfire where, um, you know, development units uh, become a, uh, a effectively an external production team and lose sight of their primary objective, which is the teaching and learning at the university and, and basically get, um, you know, stripped off the university because they're no longer doing their core work. Um, not sure on that one, Tom. Well, there is another model. Where, um, Sorry, Tom. You... I was just going to say, um, I could see um, people like yourselves acting as kind of online consultants, um, not creating stuff, but giving advice and in, information to, to universities across the globe that want to start these kind of projects and uh, support teams. Sorry, you know, I, I guess I guess that would be you know one of my hopes around the whole idea of the Escalate Mobile Learning SIG uh, and other SIGs is, is that we can have a wider impact. Um, you know, even if it's just people watching these these webinars and giving ideas, but yeah, certainly if we can ske uh, speak beyond our own context, that that'd be fantastic. Well, I'm just going to say the Australian universities have startup centres and accelerators. And um, what we have in Canberra is we have teams of students and staff um, there setting up companies. Um, and so rather than it being an activity of the university, the staff do it as a private sort of thing. Um, and some of them are successful and some of them aren't. Uh, because the campus is effectively sh still shut down, um, the teams of students are going to the startup center to have team meetings in rented space there at the moment. Mm. Uh, it does, does assume that you've got enough time to actually work two jobs though, Tom. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would suggest um, at the moment, it might be a choice between um, having that other job and then coming in one day and finding your you're uh, no longer needed at the university. Um, the yeah. way things are um, going at the moment. It's always a possibility. Um, I think it's a certainty for a large chunk of those employed at Australian universities at the moment. Well, on that, uh, that, that happy note, um, thank you very much, Meredith. Um, really enjoyed your presentation and uh, We'll put the recording up on YouTube and hopefully people watch it and give you some feedback. So if you can send some of those links to me, I'll put that into the description on the YouTube video as well. Thank you, everyone. We'll catch you all again next week.